Uh, well, the first thing I would like to address is the title. Uh, some of you in the audience know a former Atlanta named John Cagle. John called me today and he said, I just saw on the uh, internet that you're going to be giving a talk. And I want to ask you, what do you mean by absence of certainty? <laughs> so I thought, well, that's a good way to, to tell you about this show now what I meant by that. So I will just plunge right in. The first thing I want to say is that I had an absence of certainty about this work because it was a new direction for me. And I was taking a, a step away from what I had been doing for the past decade or more, I guess um, almost 15 or 20 years. And so I wasn't too sure why I wanted to go in this direction and um, whether all these works made sense together. In fact, um, the esteemed Goodman Victel had visited the studio earlier and said, but this is kind of a hodgepodge. I don't think he used the word hodgepodge, but she said, these, these don't really quite go together. And so I had an absence of certainty about whether you would understand how they all work together. The other thing I want to tell you about the choice of title is that um, Carl and I have been spending more and more time up in northwest Georgia at the farm that has uh, views of Pigeon Mountain. We are on a ridge between Lookout Mountain and Pigeon Mountain. And um, in this peacefulness, I was trying to figure out why I still felt anxiety sometimes. What, what was that about the landscape? And so, I kept staring at the landscape and trying to figure out what is it in a landscape that can be both peaceful and also um, create some uncertainty. And I began to think it's because we don't know where it starts and we don't know where it ends. And we can look down at the sketchbook to draw what we think we saw and look back up and we won't see the same landscape. Our head will move a little bit. You can't freeze the landscape. You can maybe take a photograph of it and try to freeze it. But you truly can't as the light is changing, as the seasons change. And so I say that this show is also an absence of certainty because of this experience. And then there's a third reason, and that is because I'm a certain age and in this age, I began to think, I'm ready for uncertainty. <laughs> I've been making art in the same way for, for many, many years. And I want to not know where I'm going. And I began to realize that this is an important way to address fear. Fear of getting old. Fear of everything you read in the newspaper. Fear of everything that you hear on the radio or see on television that to adopt a stance of absence of certainty, to adopt a stance of uncertainty, allows you to move with what happens. If you start saying, I'm here and I'm stuck and this is what I think and this is what I believe, then you can't tolerate all of this that's being thrown at you. So, so the third reason for absence of certainty is that this is where we all are right this minute, and maybe it's a good thing. Um, I did want to add that when I wrote a little blurb in the catalog about this, uh, I used the word precarious, because I, I said a landscape is precarious because you, um, it, 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 it's affected by circumstances beyond your control. Well, I looked up precarious, and precarious means beyond your control, and the root says, uh, it comes from Latin, and I don't know Latin well enough to pronounce it correctly, but it says in Quran, see prayer. And I think that's very interesting that we are all in these precarious times, and maybe that um, that's what's out there, the only, only recourse, see prayer. So that's the ex explanation of the title and maybe you'll see this in the work and maybe you won't. 
Uh, I brought this um, just to show you quickly. Um, this was a catalog from a show that was done, um, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And it's called Variations on a Composition. And this will just give you a, a brief look at the kinds of compositions that I had been doing until I started these. And, and one of the things about the variation is that they all have a dynamic that's going from the lower right to the upper left. Can you see that? What I'm talking about. A composition in an artwork, um, I don't want to bore those of you who already know this, but some of you might be interested to know, is the structural engineering of an artwork. It's the thing that holds the whole thing together and asks your eye to find a resting place. And so, this is the next thing I want to tell you, and after that I'll shut up. The, um, I had started this drawing, which is um, of an actual view from our uh, house looking out over Pigeon Mountain at dawn. And I thought, you know, this is a, a landscape that's going to be kind of horizontal. And I couldn't make it work. I couldn't do the structural engineering to make that drawing satisfy me. And I would be working on it, and I'd put it up on um, the mantle, and I'd say, it's not working. And in fact, I asked Carl Poe for the great art critic, and he would uh, expound on it, and he said, no, it's not working. <laughs> so I put it in a drawer, and um, I, uh, I just left it there for a while. And then I'd take it out again. And I, well, then came the time where I was determined for uncertainty. I wanted to make art that didn't look like what I had been making. I wanted to not know where I was going. And I had had the great excitement, and maybe some of you here as well, saw this absolutely gorgeous show of Huberti's work. And did you see it at the home? You know what I'm talking about? These panels are just breathtaking. And so I bought this beautiful catalog. And I sat down one um, early uh, winter day, and I said, I am going to use my technique, and I'm going to copy Huberti's structure, his composition. And that's the drawing that's behind you over there called After Huberti. Now, I'm just going to quickly tell those of you who don't know me or what I do, um, these drawings are all in color pencil hence the necklace. Um, I use Prismacolor pencil, and it's a wax-based pencil. And I work on a paper that's called Arsh hot press paper, and that means it's slick. So any ridges or anything that you feel like you're seeing, it's just the gesture of making a line, a space, and another line. And you may ask um, why I've made my own rules and I'm sticking to them. I can make art any way I want to, but I've narrowed myself to this rule, this game I play, to make my line with the space next to it. And it's interesting because I know how it got started. It got started in the early 70s when another time of uncertainty and confusion. I thought late at night after the children went to bed, I'm going to make a drawing. I'm just going to pick up a pencil and I'm just going to pull a line down and then I'm going to pull another line down. And I'm going to leave this space between. And I want to say that this line, maybe that night, was my mother. <coughs> and this line was me. And the space between was all that I will never know about her. And let's say then I made another line, and that was my husband. And the space between was everything I would never know. Well, this was just a meditative stroke, but the point was, I can also say that this was me in my most sensual self, and the 
this is me and my most rational self at war with each other inside me. These lines were an attempt to trap what's true, what I can never know, what can never be said. So that was why I started this. And I began to think just last week, the reason why I'm still doing it is because it's still a philosophy. It's still my philosophy that I don't want to be locked into one thought. I always want to believe that what's true is what's between. And Carl likes to call me the contrarian's contrarian <laughs> in politics. But suddenly I thought, my drawings are my explanation, my answer to him is that if you're on the left and you make a statement, I'm going to try to find a way to ask you to back that up. If you're on the right and you make a statement, I'm going to say, what do you mean by that? I don't want to, to believe either side. And I thought, how interesting that even in my political stance, um, this all goes back to this sense of these lines and why it's so important. So at any rate, then I'll just quickly tell you and then I'll shut up. That while I was doing this uh, piece of the Verities and investigating how he engineered this so beautifully, I began to notice that he had these two vertical lines, if you study it, that are on either side of this swirl. And I thought, I'm going to get that drawing back out and I'm going to look at it again and I'm going to see if I can put a vertical line in there and see if that makes a difference. <clears throat> and so years later, from the start, I added that tree and I thought, okay, I'm ready now to try to make these drawings, these horizontal drawings. And as you see, they're kind of a chronology and they come around and they get more and more abstract. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> 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 because you can't afford, I don't think, to make major corrections and changes. Yeah. You've got to stick to your idea from the right. beginning to start. What leads to it and what do you do to have it down so you know that this is something you can live with? Um, did everybody hear his question? No. no. Okay. He, he just said, well, you, you seem to have so much control when you're working on something. Um, but you can't erase and you can't change this color pencil once you get going. What do you, am I correct to say this? What do you, what do you do to get ready for this? And, um, and that's, the, that's the thing. I don't do anything. Because if I know where I'm going, I don't need to go there. <laughs> so um, the so most. You, you, you can envision it and you follow it. I have no yeah. clue where I'm going. I mean, that, that was why it was really interesting to do the Gaberity because I knew what I needed to do to copy him. But um, most of the time, I, I just start and then I see where it's going to take me. I, I did this drawing that's here next to Shauna that um, I had done a painting of the same view before. And, and I found it really hard to work on that drawing because I thought, I'm not taking the fun out of it. Because the fun is this tension that I don't know what, that I could avoid it at any minute. It's like tightrope walking. And the battle, the battle with each of these for the composition, they're so finely tuned. 
I mean, it, it's just a matter of, of, of watching them and seeing where the fault lines are. And so this one is obviously overworked compared to some of the others. But it, I just I kept readjusting where the composition was going. I wanted it to be horizontal. It kept fighting me because it wanted to go that way. I kept saying, no, you're not going that way. You're going that way. And um, so there are little tricks that, that came up with just putting a little red line here or here or down here or here to, to make it go horizontal. So anyway, that's fast. Yes. She is, and I'll be back. Um, you mentioned the battle yeah. in your work. Um, so I'm assuming that some are battlegrounds that you win the battle, and some of them are maybe gifts. Some of them are easier and, yeah. and maybe more capricious and, and simpler. I mean, not simpler, but you, they just weren't a battle, and, the, and, you, and they were beautiful. Do you have a, a sense of preferring winning the battle or having one just work out without a battle? Do you prefer? Well, let's say that I, I might feel that I've won about four battles in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but let me also say that, thank God, I don't think any of them are good enough. Because if I didn't, why would I do them all? I mean, it, that's the great thing, is to think, no, we don't really have this. Let me see if I can do it this way. Hmm. And so that leads me from one to the next. And I think if you look at these in that way as an evolution, you see me, you see the battle that was going on in me um, to, to try to get to simplicity. Maybe I'll come back to complexity, but I think the, the ones in there um, have, have more of a piece of, uh, they're, they're less of a battle, but they, they're a battle nonetheless. But they, this was probably the one. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Catherine. Okay. I was wondering, can you describe your process a little bit? Is it one line next to the other one, or do you kind of skip through? Um, no, I cover the entire page with um, a miniature version of what I was showing you. Just, I mean, and they're not straight. Somebody asked me if I use a straight edge. <coughs> it, it's just as steady as I can make it, but. But it's, just pull, it's a pulling down. And then what happens, why, why you can't really see that on some of them, is because they're layered like that. And there might be as many as 10 layers in color. Mm -hmm. but, but the gesture is always the same. Uh -huh. this, this so you start with a broader interval and gradually fills in. Yeah, I cover the whole page. Uh -huh. and, and then often it's just like, um, famous lines of Leonardo's thing, you look at a wall and you can begin to see things. So mm -hmm. I start thinking, oh, now, now I see where I can work on that. Don't you love the birds? <laughs> 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 Those are real birds. They don't, I'm not even hiking that. <laughs> and there, well, I'm curious about your process of choosing the colors that you want to use. Well, I only did that. Um, Oh, and and it's 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 okay. No, it's not a matter of how I how I draw them. I I draw. I just start anywhere. Um, sometimes I draw it from the left, or sometimes I draw in the middle to start. It's just what I'm in the mood, you know. You know? But these, it was a compositional ploy that was well known in the um, Baroque era. That. You know, you may have studied in art history, and certainly my students from last fall will remember this, that, that maybe in the Renaissance everything was balanced left and right, or it might have a nice triangular solid form. But by the time of um, the Reformation and the Baroque era, there was this dynamic that led the eye from in a diagonal across the the uh, canvas, and and by chance I discovered that that worked for me. That in these drawings, that if I if I had that this motion, do you see what I'm talking about? And and this is a whole different motion 
more placid, maybe more open-ended. But this this was just something that worked. And it's important, all the paper you probably noticed has been torn irregularly. And so it's important to have a that that makes the focal point that much trickier to, to make you to draw you in because it's not your common four right angles that you're comfortable with with uh, a photograph, for example, or even a frame. Because you can tell some of them really fight the frame. But I tear them that way for two reasons. One is because I'm not very good at measurement, and I never could get them just right. And two, I liked the surprise of it. I liked the fact that something quirky would happen, and then I had to work off that quirk. Is there any relationship between the time of day in these and the time that you work, the time when you start working or end of your studio day? No. Because when I started drawing, it was because I had young children and uh, one of them was here. And, you know, she, she would have to be in bed before I could start. But what about sisters? And so I would work at night, but now I can work. I work better during the day because So, but it generally, I got the habit, thanks to pencils as well as paint, to just do it any time. I can work for 15 minutes, I can work for two hours. At one point, I tried working for 14 hours, and that did not make a better drawing, and it only made me get hunched over and start looking like Richard Nixon. But since these have a, a landscape, <coughs> orientation well, quality Did that influence the time of day that you would work to observe the light or the change of light. No, no, it's all in the Yes, sir. Do you find moving into your three-dimensional sculptures gives you relief from this flat work? It does. I mean, so they feed relief. off of each <laughs> but they feed off of each other. Yeah, or they go to one and back to the other. Um, I don't have one working now, so yeah. yeah. So do you see that as I mean, is that a scene to you, or is that a distraction? Well, people who know me well know that this is a, a real thing. Um, I just don't want to talk too much about it. it, it it's it's called a mall star. Um, I told the Lane Levin this one day uh, after I went through the last show and she asked me these questions and I just started talking and talking and the next morning I called her and I said, I feel like a teenage girl that put out too much <laughs> There's got to be some mystery here, Bob. It's what you see. <laughs> I'm just so scared I'll tell you more than you really need to know uh, because It's anything you want it to be. I just hope you'll you'll uh, find a connection to at least one of the moments. Yeah. Um, just you're mentioning the idea of the gesture uh -huh. gives it a whole different dimension uh -huh. for the people because I mean it's not a control work. It's a gesture thing. Yeah. <laughs> Drawing. That's so hard. it's fun to think of it in that. Yeah. Many, many, many yeah. thousands of gestures. You're right. All right. Oh, Susie? Well, you know, your landscape seemed to me to have such a, an instantaneousness, you know, a moment that when I look at it, I look at it and it's one moment. Yeah. But how long does it really take for you to, you know, arrive at your painting? Well, that would take a couple of years, but um, most of them are a matter of months. Months. But the, the thing about the landscape is that it has to be in my head because there's no way I can, I, I've tried in my sketchbook, there's no way that I can draw it as I see it. Because as I see it, it's changing. And there's a famous line from Cezanne, he said, if I just move one inch, I have a different landscape. So um, there's no way, you know, a camera can pretend to catch it but I'm hoping to catch more. There was a wonderful line that Picasso said about Cezanne, and, and I would love to think that one day I'd be able to do what Cezanne was able to do, was to 
catch the anxiety. And there's a poem that um, Sue Williams and I know well that was written by um, Zimborska, a uh, Polish poet, woman poet, um, and it's called A Moment. And she's looking at a landscape, and it's also peaceful. And then she shifts into gears to talk about the fact that that landscape had, had eruptions and corruptions and floods and rains and wars. <coughs> and, and then she ends by mentioning that it's, it goes back to one moment in time. But for the beauty that you see, I mean, that mountain that, that keeps inspiring me used to be under the sea. You can find seashell fossils there. Well, so when you look at it, there is an element of anxiety. The fact that well, oh, it was also owned by the Cherokee Indians who got driven off of it. And there's, there's no ownership. There's no um, prominency to a landscape. And that's you know, enough. Okay. Do you work on one drawing at a time or many? I usually work on one. All right, if I bored you completely silly by now, everybody has heard a lot of them. No more questions? Oh, wait, a question. Okay, so are you going to continue with landscapes now, or have you started a new direction? Well, I have a, a drawing on the table right now that's uh, just a continuation of this, which was exciting to, to think, oh, I'm not through. We're going to get the rest of this out of here. So.